I'm very pleased to be joined by United States Representative from Brooklyn, Yvette Clark. She represents New York's 11th Congressional District in the House of Representatives. Welcome to Citywide. Well, thank you for having me, Ken. January is going to be a pretty exciting month in Washington. You're going to take Indeed. your oath of office for a new term. And then on January 20th, um, as a member of the House of Representatives, you will be present when Barack Obama is sworn in as president of the United States. How does that feel? Wow. It, 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 I, I tell people I'm in a constant state of euphoria when I just think about it, um, you know, th with such a historic presidential run. And to see it just sort of uh, escalate to what we're experiencing in Washington with people calling in, they want to be there for the inauguration. It, you know, I feel privileged to have been elected at the same time that reelected at the same time that we had Barack Obama elected as president of the United States and uh, very hopeful. You know, he, he, he spoke of hope and, you know, he convinced me. Uh, I'm an eternal optimist. And uh, to see uh, the type of campaign that he put together, the issues that he spoke to, and, and it was congruous with what we were doing in the House of Representatives. And so there's some momentum going into the 111th. We've got a strong majority in the House, a much larger majority in the Senate, um, and we have a Democratic president. So I think there's a lot to be hopeful for. Did you feel frozen out as a Democrat in the Bush years? Well, I only served one term in the Bush administration, and I can tell you that my observation and what I actually experienced was a lot of obstructionism coming from the Republicans. Uh, all of the things that we could have done to be preventive in a number of the crises that we face today were just sort of kicked down the road, kicked down the road, uh, blocked um, and interfered with by the administration. They had an agenda and they intended to see that agenda through and it was very clear in every uh, committee hearing I attended as well as when we went to the floor for votes. It seemed to me that after September 11th, the city of New York was readmitted to the United States of America. <laughs> In the last campaign, there was some anti-elitist rhetoric with finger pointing towards uh, New York, but there wasn't as much anti-Wall Street populist rhetoric as you might have expected. Does the financial crisis affect New York City's um, status in the Congress? It, 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 it's very strange because people, for some reason, separate uh, Wall Street from New York City. Uh, we know that they're inextricably linked. Uh, and so for the New York delegation, it's, you know, standing together in unison and in unity saying that, you know, we have to be very conscious as we speak about what took place in the financial institutions that happened to reside on Wall Street, that we recognize that there was a city and there was a state and there's a nation that's highly dependent on its well-being. We spoke about the fact that, you know, when we talk about the automobile industry in Michigan, um, it's a similar phenomenon. Uh, that industry generates jobs, you know, throughout the United States while it's housed in Michigan and in the Midwestern states. So that we were able to, to make that argument, um, you know, it, because there was a real backlash uh, when all of the uh, financial implosions began. And given the impact that this is having on the country, on the world, um, does it does it put you in an awkward position where you have to work to save the business system of America at a time when so many of your constituents are um, struggling just to make ends meet? Well, you know, that's what I think is, 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 has been so uh, inspiring about the Democratic caucus, because there we really think through the policy issues and implications and try to come up with the best policies to bring balance to the equation. And it's really about balance. You know, uh, we are looking at an unprecedented restructuring of the financial system that basically runs the world. 
when you talk about what emanates from Wall Street, we can talk about what has happened in Tokyo, what has happened in, in Europe. Uh, it's all, all linked together. We can talk about issues of trade. We can talk about issues of education. All of them come together in how we generate income and finance in this nation. And unfortunately, you know, it went so unregulated for so long that, you know, we have to, you know, we have to look at the implications of what that has meant for those of us who live on Main Street and who had relied on uh, expert opinions to invest our pensions, to invest our monies for our retirement. Um, and unfortunately, you know, they were untrustworthy. And so, you know, it's all, it, it's, it's, very, it's very complex yet, yet simple uh, to let the financial institutions continue to, uh, to, to, to teeter on the brink of, of, uh, of collapse uh, would not have been prudent and certainly would not have been in the best interest of New York City and New York State. And so, you know, where there had to be a lot of conversation um, in the Democratic caucus to look at, all right, if, if, if we don't act, hear what the implications are uh, for New Yorkers, from the New York delegation, and for the nation. Um, and I think we came up with uh, the best and reasonable answers that we could. Uh, we knew that we would get pushback from the, from the Republicans. And the, and the Bush administration. And we certainly did. I mean, you know, when they came out uh, ultimately with the bailout package, uh, we, we could not abide with it because, you know, it was sort of a three-page document that uh, said, you know, give us full unfettered power to use $750 billion how we see fit. And even when it got fleshed out, they wound up using the money differently from what they told well, you they would. I, I kind of um, intuitively <clears throat> knew that it was just going to be a toolbox because at that stage, they really didn't have a full handle mm -hmm. on exactly what was going on. And, and, and that speaks to uh, the negligence of the administration. They had every regulatory tool and instrument at their disposal to know what was going on in the business sector, to know what was going on in the financial sector, and they chose to, to, to turn a blind eye to it by deregulating. And uh, ultimately, they got what they paid for, and we all had to suffer the consequences. Is it realistic to think, though, that given the vast amount of money that's going to go into the bailout, and possibly for the automobile industry as well, the reduction in taxes as incomes and transactions go down. Is it realistic to think that a Democratic president and Democratic Congress are going to be able to um, keep their promise to the American people to expand programs immediately, health care, uh, repair of Social Security, aid to education, all of the kind of value issues that Democrats campaigned on, um, are they going to have to wait until later in the Obama administration? I think that what's good, what you're going to see is the framework built out. And as uh, economic conditions uh, improve, uh, there will be more and more uh, added to the framework so that at the appropriate time, and we no one knows what that time is, quite frankly, um, we can do a rollout of all of those key pieces that need to be put in place that were basically called upon by the, the, by the, the electorate that we address. Um, but ultimately, right now, it's very clear to me that we're going to have to concentrate on stabilizing uh, the financial infrastructure of the nation. Uh, this foreclosure um, um, phenomena, which it, it truly is, we've never, I mean, perhaps since the Depression, seen uh, this level of, of rapid foreclosures. And we're going to have to address that. That, that in itself is going to be a huge, huge task, um, let alone uh, opening up credit for people who are credit worthy to continue to live their lives, to send their children to school, to purchase new homes. It's not like homes are not going to be sold, um, or, or, or automobiles for that matter. But we, we need to open up those corridors for small business, to have those li lines of credit that they need to keep people employed. So, I mean, it's an ecosystem unto itself. Are you um, seeing the consequences in your district yet? Are, 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 are people, um, your constituents, when they come to you, 
Um, are you hearing different issues, different concerns from them than you did a few months ago? Well, it's, 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 it's all tied to, to the economy. Um, just about two weeks ago, just prior to the election, we in my uh, district office hosted a, a job fair. And I was just amazed at the numbers of people that came out looking for employment. We had over 800 people come through my office. And that was, you know, in, in a very short span of time. If we had publicized it longer, we may have even seen more people coming out. Uh, that's one of those intangibles that you don't see, uh, the numbers of unemployed in, in, in our midst. In addition to that, we'd been hearing all along, ever since I'd uh, gotten into office in 06, people coming in desiring to have their mortgages uh, refinanced, repackaged, because they were slipping. A lot of folks began slipping, and uh, you know they wanted to mitigate the circumstances before they went into foreclosure. There was no vehicle for people to do that, so they had to go into foreclosure. It, it, it was really a, a sad sight to see. Uh, the extreme of that we've not seen in New York City yet compared to other parts of the country. Um, we've heard of uh, examples in Nevada, in Ohio, where you have whole tax bases basically gone. What does that mean? Police services. Uh, sanitation services, all the municipal services that rely the on muscle, the The muscle of government, not exactly. just the fat. Exactly, exactly. So, it, you know, it, it, it is taking place. Uh, we are seeing it to the same extent that we're seeing in other parts of the nation, but uh, we're about to really see some tough times here in New York City. Uh, the mayor's cuts uh, are, are extraordinary, um, and so, uh, so is the governor. The governor's about to do about $2 billion in cuts. Um, I think that to, for every one of those cuts, we have to bear in mind that there were people <coughs> in those positions who are employees, um, and they, they run households. A lot of, 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 of civil servants uh, will, will be feeling the brunt of that. Uh, also in the financial sector, we know there are a lot of folks who uh, wear financial services that are uh, no longer employed in that industry. So there's going to have to be a lot of work done. I uh, apologize for mm -hmm. my cough and my hoarseness is um, not entirely a function of uh, cheering over the election <laughs> results. Um, uh, we're going to continue our conversation with Yvette Clark when Citywide comes back right after this. Oh, I must be careful. Oh, that's a nice picture. Come on, Anna. Okay. Foreclosure doesn't affect just you. It affects your whole family, too. If you've fallen behind on your mortgage, we can help. Call 1-888-995-HOPE, because nothing is worse than doing nothing. Welcome back to Citywide. We're speaking with Brooklyn Congresswoman Yvette Clark. To the victor goes the spoils. Most elected officials in New York in the Democratic uh, primary supported our Senator Hillary Clinton. She was not the Democratic nominee. Um, I can't think of a single white elected official who supported Barack Obama from New York, and only a very small number of African American officials. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's going to affect the dynamic between uh, between President Obama and uh, the New York political structure? I, I don't think so. And, and, you know, you being a former politician know that there will be opportunities. And, you know, we all, when Barack became the Democratic nominee, jumped in there full force to support him, to organize, work with those who had organized in our communities to make sure that the vote was there for him coming out of our districts as well. But beyond that, you know, we're a pretty large delegation. And we uh, are going to be needed in many of the efforts that he wants to pursue in terms of policy. And there are any number of New York uh, congressional representatives who are now important committee chairs. Exactly, exactly. So I, I just don't see uh, that happening. I think that, you know, it's, it's all a matter of growth and a matter of relationship building. And I think the appropriate relationships are being built. And I look forward to working with uh, President Obama. Let's talk about race. Mm -hmm. It is remarkable to me how unremarkable it is that David Patterson, mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. governor of the state of New York, obviously a historic moment when he became the first African-American uh, governor, but after that initial flurry of stories, not much of a discussion. Mm -hmm. The New York State Senate turning Democratic with the likely uh, leader of the state Senate, uh, Malcolm Smith, African-American from Queens. Mm -hmm. The fact that he is African-American barely mentioned, not nearly as significant as the fact that he's the first Democrat in that position mm -hmm. in, uh, in many years. Um, do you think there, that the Obama election and the ascendancy of these other political leaders has changed the conversation about race, n not just in the country, but specifically here in New York? I think I think that what it's done is it's just brought it to the a consciousness level and a, and a, a conscious ne just level that, uh, <coughs> that, that has I guess, bought some agreement. Uh, agreement that, you know, we are a very diverse uh, city and state and that talent comes in a whole lot of different packages. I think we're fortunate in New York in that we've worked in an environment where, uh, you know, y y your co-workers of different races, ethnicities, uh, religious persuasions, sexual orientation. So. Uh, it doesn't come as much of a surprise to us. I mean, we've had David Dinkins, uh, you know, we've had Herman Badillo, we've, you know, so we've had a history of leadership coming out of New York that has been very diverse. Well, what about gender? So, mm -hmm. you know, your colleague Carolyn Maloney uh, published a book over the summer pointing out that the glass ceiling uh, seemed to be um, uh, more uh, resistant to, uh, to change. Um, gender played a role in uh, some of the coverage and mm -hmm. criticism of Hillary Clinton. And I think you could make the argument that uh, the selection of Sarah Palin for mm -hmm. the Republican ticket was the ultimate in chauvinistic yeah. affirmative action. <laughs> um, it, are those barriers for women real? Is, and are they more resistant to change than, than race barriers? I, I think they are. I, I think they are, and you know, we've been in a male-dominated society for generations. And uh, as much as uh, women uh, progress, uh, they're still held to a different standard. And I, you know, it's a gender-based standard that is built into a philosophy that uh, women don't equal up to men. And it, it, and so you know, it's 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 a ongoing. Uh, struggle for that uh, recognition of uh, intellectual capabilities, physical capabilities. You know, when you look at New York City's fire department, I think you can probably count the number of women firefighters on uh, both hand and feet, if that many. Uh, and certainly, when you when you look at uh, you know the various male dominant, even even in politics today, I think that's where it's most prevalent. Uh, there's still uh, women, when you, when you say nurse, people typically would look to uh, see a female immediately as opposed to a male. Sometimes when you say teacher, you know, that, be, that is the case. Not, not as much today as it was yesterday, but, you know, that's still, there, there have been these, uh, I guess, sort of uh, boxes that, that we've put uh, each gender in that, uh, that are still, uh, you know, that leaves a lot of work to be done in that area. I do believe that Hillary Clinton did, did produce 18 million cracks. And I think that if we concentrate on the fact that um, she did something that was remarkable um, and we give credit to that, um, then we begin to you know, build on that strength. Uh, in, in, around the nation, there are a lot of women who are governors of states. And so we're beginning to see a lot of movement in, in, in that regard, but there will always be that banter that goes into, you know, specifics around gender. And, uh, you know, I was asked earlier, did, uh, did I, uh, is this like a Sarah Palin type uh, purchase? You're, you're, you're <laughs> what suit, I'm right? And I said, you know, I'm the greatest bargain hunter. <laughs> but the fact that that becomes a, a question, right. uh, wh which is not necessarily asked of men, right. becomes an issue. The fact that women wear cosmetics and men don't, uh, you know, that, that's, an, you know, for the most part, uh, that becomes an issue. Uh, these are just um, gender differences, and, then, and, and it's gender diversity. And women uh, will approach the, uh, the workplace uh, in a different way that, that men are. And the expectations uh, are, uh, you know, 
typically based off of uh, what, what men project about women. And uh, we have to change that by being there to say, well, it's not necessarily so. Uh, or what if you're wrong? Well, certainly, you know, in the, in the congressional delegation from mm -hmm. New York City, um, many women, many women emerging in positions of, uh, of power in Brooklyn, I guess, uh, two of the four congressional seats uh, held by women. Mm -hmm. uh, in Manhattan, it's, I guess, one of three. Yeah. Um, and I guess women, Speaker, West, of, yeah. Speaker of, of the House of Representatives. Uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi. Let me shift gears radically, if I can, for a second, sure. um, because he shifted gears radically. Mayor Bloomberg changed his mind about term limits. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about that, and how do you see the mayoral election playing out next wow, year? Wow, that, that's just going to be a very interesting uh, dynamic. I think that uh, the mayor uh, did a disservice because I think that uh, the level of trust that people have in him is something that uh, you know he should he should honor and treasure and and, and step lightly with and be, be humble about. And I think that his leadership, uh, with his leadership people would have been receptive to a campaign that really addressed term limits. Mm -hmm. um, but so you the, think it should have been a referendum? I think it should have been a referendum. You know, that issue has never really hit the, the, the public square mm -hmm. in the way that I believe it should, particularly for people who've been a part of, of, of the political arena and can speak to actual flaws in it. Uh, those voices aren't heard in the conversation around term limits, and it's going to be hard to hear them now because of the the way that uh, the mayor went about uh, getting this done. Uh, it set a bad precedent. Let's let's talk about precedent. Uh, are, is it going to be that each cohort of council members now, in, at the end of their second term, will want, want to, to do the same thing? Exactly. Uh, and how do we, as the public, deny them that when? The precedent is already set. You know, who knows what future emergencies will come up, and who will happen to be mayor at the time right. that it happens? You know, we may have you know someone who is really good in, in environmental science when you know the first flood comes through New York City. Do we then keep that person um, in place because uh, they have that expertise? I don't know. You know, I don't think that that's the best way that that we deliver the democratic message, the the what a democracy is about, and how we go about changing a democracy. So uh, that's what's going to make the mayoral race uh, dynamic very interesting. It will really be up to the citizenry whether uh, they can um, feel confident that setting this precedent is the best way, the healthiest way for us to go in a democratic. Um, society. My thanks to Brooklyn United States Representative Yvette Clark. I'm being very careful not to call you a congresswoman. <laughs> she represents New York's 11th congressional district in the House of Representatives. I'm Ken Fisher. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Citywide.